Welcome everybody to One World Mathematical Game Theory Seminar. Today we're happy to have with us Tao Wang. He is PhD in the economic department at Stony Brook University, then came to do a postdoc in Tel Aviv University, School of Mathematical Sciences. He is currently an assistant professor at Nanjing Audit University. <clears throat> and he is continuing his uh, work with the uh, Eud Lehrer, the cooperation with Eud Lehrer. Uh, they have work about values of information, and today he will present to us uh, work about stochastic dominance and subjective option valuations. How the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks Galit for introducing me, and thanks everyone for coming to my talk. Uh, so it is my pleasure to present this joint work with Ehud Lehrer here. Uh, as we know that when decision makers face the uh, dynamic decision problems under uncertainty, uh, very often uh, different, we see that different decision makers, they hold different prior beliefs about the same unknown state of nature. Uh, this may due to, for instance, uh, the difference in their past experience or knowledge and or simply because they have different personalities. And some people tend to be more optimistic while others tend to be more pessimistic so uh, this is reflected in the difference in their uh, prior belief about the same unknown state of nature. So what we do in this paper is the following. So our objective is to investigate the implications of uh, several well-known stochastic dominance relations among prior beliefs in the so-called binomial tree model, uh, including we discuss uh, the following stochastic dominance orders uh, including first order stochastic dominance, uh, hazard rate dominance, and the reverse hazard rate dominance, and uh, the likelihood ratio dominance. Okay, notice that these stochastic dominance relations are related to the location or uh, magnitude of a random variables. Uh, so uh, as a result, we do not discuss those uh, stochastic dominance relations related to dispersion or the variation of random variables, such as the second and the third de degree stochastic dominance. Okay, so in particular, we establish connections among the following conditions. First, uh, the stochastic dominance relation among prior beliefs. And second, we look at the stochastic dominance relations among posterior conditional uncertain histories. And third, we examine the stochastic dominance relation of probability distributions over certain histories. Because you know that different histories may lead to different payoff. So therefore, uh, by looking at the probability distribution over a certain set of histories, uh, we can calculate and uh, compare uh, the values of a different prior beliefs. Uh, okay, and uh, as an application, we'll examine the implication of a subjective uh, uh, valuation of options, including the European and the American options. Uh, we'll talk to, to that later. But uh, let me first start with the so-called tree model or binomial model. It is actually very simple. So each period, a uh, decision maker observes a random outcome, either U or D. You can think of U as up or D as down. And the probability that uh, a new outcome is observed each period is given by P, okay? So P is unknown to the decision maker. And uh, the decision maker holds a prior belief about P. You can think about uh, U or D as increase or decrease in a firm's sales or profit. And the P uh, can be interpreted as the performance of a firm. Okay, and also in uh, you can you can imagine in setup of uh, online rating, U or D may refer to thumbs up or thumbs down, and P is uh, a parameter that reflects how satisfied a consumer will be uh, from purchasing uh, from the, uh, some online store. Okay, uh, so here notice that uh, the observations in different periods are independent, conditional on the true state. And the state of nature P uh, remains uh, time invariant, okay? Uh, 
So here we denote by the small ht a uh, particular uh, history of length t. And uh, given a history, one can calculate the empirical frequency or simply frequency uh, associated with this history, which is denoted by theta ht. And this is simply the number of uh, outcome u's um, observed divided by the total number of observations t. Okay, and a set of uh, length t histories is denoted by capital H t, and we denote by this curly H t as the set of uh, all length t histories. Uh, notice that uh, a history here has uh, two uh, functions. Uh, first, it uh, allows the decision maker to update his knowledge about this unknown state p, and second, it determines the payoff. Okay. So these are the two functions of uh, uh, history. So first, let's look at uh, the, the well-known uh, first order stochastic dominance and examine its implications in the binomial tree model. And the first order stochastic dominance is perhaps the best known uh, stochastic dominance relations and is uh, widely applied in economics. Uh, so the definition is, uh, I, I believe is well known. So we say that F first order stochastically dominates G if the CDF uh, of, at every point is uh, greater under G than under F. Uh, a nice thing about first order stochastic dominance is that it has a very nice equivalence condition expressed in terms of expectations. So if we, uh, so if F first order stochastic dominates G, if and only if, take any increasing function u, of course, u has to be measurable with respect to f and g. Okay? The expected value of u under f is greater than the expected value of u under g. So if you think about uh, u as the, uh, as the uh, increasing pay, as a payoff function of uh, a decision maker, uh, then this condition says that every uh, decision maker who preferred more to less uh, will attach higher expected value under a uh, first order stochastically dominating prior. Uh, this, this condition is quite useful. And uh, uh, this is one reason why uh, first order stochastic dominance is so well. Uh, and notice that uh, here in the tree model for any period t, f and similarly g will induce a probability distribution over the t plus one empirical frequencies via the following formula. So before we look at the formula, perhaps the following figure will illustrate the idea better. So this is a, a standard uh, tree model. Okay, so here there are five uh, different per five periods. In period five, there are six different knots. For instance, if you look at uh, the third knot from the bottom, so this, uh, so there are ten histories uh, leads to this uh, point. Okay, so all points or all histories have the same empirical frequency point four. Okay, so if we are given a particular prior, uh, well, one can calculate the probability of observing uh, uh, a history at each knot in period five. Okay, so, so therefore we obtain a probability distribution over these uh, period five uh, frequencies. Uh, so that's what we do here. So in the parenthesis, so it, it, inside here, this expression is simply the probability of observing a history with uh, empirical frequency k over t when the true state is p. But the decision maker does not know p, and then you simply take expectation, and then you get uh, this uh, probability here. So now the question we ask is, what is the implication of uh, uh, stochastic, first order stochastic dominance uh, in terms of this expect, uh, in terms of this probability distributions over these uh, uh, knots or empirical frequencies? So here is our result. Uh, it, it's consider two prior beliefs F and G about the true uh, about the state of nature P. Okay. So F first order stochastically dominates G, if and only if take any period T, okay? Then the probability distributions over the T plus one empirical frequencies under F first order stochastically dominates that under G, okay? So, uh, uh, 
this is the, the main result for first order stochastic dominance. But notice that uh, it is well known that first order stochastic dominance is not preserved under conditioning. It means that, firstly, if we take a, a subset of the support, let's say D, okay, uh, suppose that F and D uh, both have uh, positive uh, measures uh, on D, and then restricted to this set D, uh, F does not necessarily first order stochastically dominates G restricted to the same set. Okay, so if you, uh, we think about a particular history, then the posterior beliefs does not necessarily uh, preserve first order stochastic dominance. And the same also holds true for a subset of histories. So these are not really good properties because you know, it's a first order stochastic dominance, although it is a very nice property, but it is, uh, does not survive any uh, conditioning. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's the problem with first order stochastic dominance. And it's not surprising because it is a, a it's very weak notion of stochastic dominance. And so what is the, uh, sometimes it is useful to look at probability distributions over uh, subsets of histories instead of uh, 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 each, uh, instead of these knots separately. Okay, for instance, uh, here uh, in period five, one can think of uh, the, uh, the following partition, A1, A2, and A3. Uh, we can ask what is the probability uh, distribution over this set of, uh, uh, over these atoms. So naturally, uh, uh, the theorem one generates the following corollary. So consider any such partition PT uh, of, uh, the, of all the histories of the same length T, okay? And for such that for any uh, history in an uh, atom with higher index, the empirical frequency is greater. Then uh, F first order stochastically dominates G if and only if for any such partition, the probability distribution over the atoms of P uh, under F first order stochastically dominates that under G. So this, this is a, a natural corollary and it uh, follows directly from the uh, theorem one. But uh, sometimes it, yes. I, I'm sorry for cutting you in. Uh, is it okay if I ask a question now? Yeah, sure, sure, of course. Um, I actually have a question about, uh, it's the terminology, but also about the picture. So I think I understand yeah. the picture that you did. So uh, in your terminology, this five nodes that are depicted or six nodes that are depicted yes. in blue here, are these histories? Uh, these, these are not histories. Uh, these are uh, uh, not histories. Okay. Uh, but uh, these, uh, each knot, for, for instance, uh, the second knot from the top, there are five different histories lead to this knot. Yeah, okay. okay so yeah, but uh, yeah. Thank so you. thanks for Thank clarifying you. this. Yes, yes. Yeah. They, they just correspond to different empirical frequencies. Yeah, okay. very good. Thank you. Okay. So let me continue. Uh, so yeah, so this is basically uh, uh, the results for first order stochastic dominance. So we look at its implication for uh, option valuation. First, uh, European op options. So what is an European option? A European call option or put option gives its holder the right, but not obligation to buy or sell a unit of certain asset for a certain price, referred to as the strike price at a specific future date, uh, which is referred to as the expiration date. Okay, so notice that you can only choose to exercise or not at the expiration date, not before. So uh, everything here is fixed, uh, the expiration date, strike price, and uh, it, the, the, the asset price is given by this function, uh, which depend on uh, the location uh, of the tree, okay? Or it more precisely depends on the empirical frequencies, okay? Assume that the asset price uh, is in great monotone in K. So the, uh, if the empirical frequency is higher, then the payoff is uh, higher or, or the asset price is higher. So the, term, uh, the termination payoff for call option is a uh, maximum of these two items, okay? So notice that uh, 
traditionally uh, the, the asset, uh, the option pricing focuses on the no arbitrage approach, namely that uh, one can construct a portfolio using existing assets that exactly replicate the price movement of the underlying asset uh, under consideration. So uh, the equilibrium option price must prevent any arbitrage opportunity because the uh, portfolio exactly mimics the price movement of the underlying asset. So uh, the prior belief, uh, the belief of uh, whether uh, the, the next period you will observe an up uh, or down outcome does not really play a role here, right? So uh, that's the problem with the uh, no arbitrage approach. And here we focus on the so-called subjective uh, option valuation. So suppose that one cannot exactly replicate the price movement, movement of the underlying asset. Uh, for instance, the market is uh, incomplete. Uh, there are uh, uh, such as, uh, for instance, there are many real options where the underlying assets are not financial assets, but some tangible assets like the opportunity to make a certain investment or the opportunity to use a certain piece of land for a particular purpose within a certain period of time. So uh, these kind of options are referred to as real options. And very often you cannot find a, a, a portfolio that exactly replicate the price movement. Uh, therefore, uh, in such situations, prior beliefs becomes a crucial a part of uh, the option valuation. And that's our focus here because we want to highlight the impact of different prior beliefs. So uh, let's look at what we can do with the first order stochastic dominance. So oh, uh, yeah. can, you, can you say a few words about what all this means? So my understanding of the asset pricing was that this was a reflection of the belief about the state of the world. So yes. the, the more ups you, you see, then the higher is your posterior belief that the state is good. Yes. And now we are talking about some other beliefs. So what uh, beliefs do you have in mind in the last part of the slide? Uh, so here so, we're so, talking... so why would the price move for any other reason than updating your beliefs? after k observations uh so so here uh, to be more precise we're looking at ex ante valuation of an option okay so let's say we're uh, right at the beginning of uh, this tree let's say here okay suppose for a an european option it's you can hold it for a fixed time a uh, period of time let's say period five uh, in in five periods and then you decide whether to exercise it or not and uh, because at uh, period zero, a different, uh, uh, different decision makers, let's say they hold different prior beliefs. One belief uh, first order stochastically dominating another belief, okay? So we want to examine, so uh, the, the value that different decision makers uh, have at, uh, at, the, uh, at period zero about, uh, you know, uh, the, the value of the same option. Okay, so that's- so uh, how, how is the asset uh, value determined if there are different beliefs about uh, P? What, what is the meaning of the price? Who determines the price? Uh, are you referring to this asset price? Yes. This here? Yeah. Uh, this is known. It's uh, given exogenously, assume. It is assumption. Is that okay? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it fixes uh, some uh, price functions, okay? Uh, but maybe we can also allow for uncertainty in, in the price. Uh, I mean, if you move, if the price can either move up or down. Uh, but when it moves up, you don't know exactly how much it moves up. Maybe it moves up by, let's say, 1%, or maybe moves up by 5%. You can uh, the asset price may subject to this kind of uh, exogenous uncertainty. Okay. So, uh, so just one last one question: yeah. K is the period 
or is uh, that sorry. a reflection of the, the of this k small k here is the number of uh, ups you observe okay and and capital t is the, the expiration date or the the total duration of this option so uh, suppose that at uh, because here for a european option we only care about the last period so by the last period t here if you observe uh, k uh, ups then uh, that your payoff would be given by this function s of k t, capital t is that uh, does that answer the question or clarifying yes. okay so uh, so actually the following result follows immediately from uh, theorem one so for two prior beliefs f and g about the state of nature p uh, f first order stochastically dominates G if and only if the ex ante value of every European call option is, is greater under F than under G. Okay, so uh, and similarly for the second part, it's, uh, it's completely analogous. Uh, so here, uh, that's the for uh, all we have for first order stochastic dominance. Uh, and this is a kind of a warm up. So, uh, he, but we know that first order stochastic dominance is a weak one, and we can when we, we we can strengthen it by considering, for instance, the hazard rate dominance and reverse hazard rate dominance. We know that by definition, F reverse hazard rate dominates G if the following holds. Okay, and uh, F hazard rate dominates G if uh, uh, this expression holds. Notice that here F and G are radon nicotine derivatives with respect to some common measure, which is not necessarily the Lebesgue measure. Uh, as a result, there can be uh, atoms in the distribution. So it captures really uh, 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 very general situations, okay? But notice that to check for uh, hazard rate dominance and reverse hazard rate dominance, one needs to calculate uh, the Radon de nicotine derivatives first, uh, which may not be so convenient in, partic in particular when there are atoms. Okay, so uh, we find that the alternative de definition uh, very useful, and these are, by the way, very well uh, well known in the literature. So uh, f reverse hazard rate dominance g if and only if take any pH greater than pL, the ratio of uh, the CDFs measured at pH is greater than the ratio of PDF uh, measured at PL. And for a hazard rate dominance, uh, we have a similar uh, definition in terms of uh, survival, survival, survival functions. So the, the following figure illustrates the graphical property of these alternative definitions in terms of CDFs, okay? So uh, let's consider transformation phi uh, that maps from the unit interval to itself such that f equals the uh, phi of g. For instance, let's take a look at the, the panel on the left. On the vertical and horizontal axis, we plot the values of f and g respectively. And for instance, uh, if uh, uh, at the, uh, a value at a pl, g pl equals this uh, constant g0 here. Well, FPL is this, this number. So uh, the, the function, the transformation phi maps G0 to this level. So we have this point A on the graph of uh, phi. So similarly, uh, for a higher value pH, uh, it's G uh, pH is still the same thing, but we see that FPH is uh, higher. So therefore, the uh, the transformation phi is uh, correspondence in general. Okay. So what the uh, these definitions for uh, reverse hazard rate dominance says is that if we connect a point, let's say he, uh, let's say a here on the graph of phi to the origin, okay, then the slope uh, of this line segment will gradually increase as we move uh, the point to the to the right. In other words, uh, imagine that uh, you are standing at uh, any point on this uh, red curve or this transformation. Then at any point, you can observe the origin, okay? Or if you put a light bulb at the origin, the light can reach any point on this uh, uh, phi function. So that's a nice uh, graphical property. 
for the for reverse hazard rate dominance. For hazard rate dominance, we have something similar, but it's res with respect to the other extreme point, one one. Okay, so uh, at uh, if you put a light bulb at one one, then its light can reach every point on this on this uh, uh, transformation. That's the graphical property here, and. Uh, this graph, using this uh, equivalence condition in terms of uh, CDF, one can derive uh, the fo following equivalence condition uh, it phrased in terms of expectations, okay? So th this equivalence condition says that uh, F reverse hazard rate dominates G if and only if the following uh, inequality hold. And this uh, expression, it could be more useful, but of course the denominators have to be non-negative. Uh, for all function u and v such that the expectation exists and uh, v is uh, non-negative and increasing and u is uh, increasing, okay? Uh, here by increasing, decreasing, we mean weakly increasing or decreasing. Uh, so uh, uh, one way to understand this uh, equivalence condition is the following. For any V which is non-negative and uh, decreasing, we can define a new CDF, F hat, as the following. Essentially, this is uh, uh, just a, a change of measure, okay? So the, then the equivalent condition simply says that under this transformed CDF, uh, F hat first order stochastically dominates G hat, okay? So uh, this condition is actually very useful because uh, for in, uh, because the uh, the posterior beliefs conditional on certain set of histories or uh, can be written in this uh, uh, form in like this right uh, as you will see uh, so it, it allows us to uh, to derive some results related to uh, posterior beliefs and analogously we have a similar result for hazard rate dominance uh, this is the equivalence condition. Notice that the difference here is this V function, which is assumed to be non-negative and increasing, while for reverse hazard rate dominance, it's decreasing, okay? So the, the rest of the things are the same. Uh, using these equivalence conditions, we can derive the following result uh, of a reverse hazard rate dominance in the tree model. So suppose F and G are non-degenerate at zero or one. It means that F and G do not put all probability mass to either zero or one. Uh, in other words, it implies that each history can be observed with positive probability, okay? So if you make such assumption, then the following conditions are equivalent. First, F uh, reverse hazard rate dominates G. And second, for any period T and take any threshold theta, uh, between zero and one, and define a set of history uh, capital H T minus as the as the collection of all histories of the of length T, uh, such that the empirical frequencies is less than this given threshold theta. Okay, so uh, then the posterior beliefs uh, conditional on this uh, set of histories preserves uh, hazard rate dominance relation. That's the second condition. Uh, in, in a sense, the first and second equivalence of first to second condition says that uh, reverse hazard rate dominance can be uh, preserved under conditioning. And this is already by contrast to the first order stochastic dominance. And the third condition is slightly weaker. It says that for the same set of history considered in, in two, uh, uh, F conditional on this set, first order stochastically dominates G conditional on this set. So we show that under a weaker condition, namely three, uh, one, it is already enough to guarantee F uh, reverse hazard rate dominates G. And uh, the fourth condition says that consider the same set uh, as in two and three, uh, the probability distribution over uh, this uh, set of histories induced by F first order stochastically dominates the probability distribution uh, over this set induced by G, okay? 
So uh, one, two, three are in terms of uh, priors and posteriors, and number four is in terms of uh, uh, probability distribution over uh, a, a certain set of uh, histories. So uh, this figure may illustrates uh, the set under consideration better. So let's look at the panel on the left. So uh, this the uh, set uh, HT minus here corresponds to the all histories uh, that leads to these three knots at the bottom. Okay, so this is for reverse hazard rate dominance. Y you can of course imagine what happens for uh, hazard rate dominance. On the figure on the right already give you some hint. Uh, oh. Exactly, is, yeah. So I, I'm sorry again. What's the difference between three and four? Uh, okay, uh, three is uh, the posterior belief conditional on this set of history. Okay, so th this is posterior belief. Okay, and four is the probability distribution over histories. For instance, uh, look at the panel on the, the left. Uh, and the, there are three uh, blue blue dots on the bottom, right? And each uh, at each bot each knot, there's a uh, few histories uh, uh, that leads to this knot in period five. Okay, then uh, essentially what probably uh, what proposition four says is that we look at probability distribution over these three knots. Okay. So re recall that for first order stochastic dominance, we look at the uh, the probability distribution over the entire uh, over all the knots in period uh, five. Here we just look a subset, the namely the uh, the knots at the bottom. And uh, it says that uh, if uh, for any if for any such set of histories, uh, the probability distribution under F first order stochastically dominates the probability distribution over G, uh, then it is one can guarantee that, you know, the F, F for, uh, F hazard rate dominates G. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you, thank you. It was the notation. Yeah, so, so it's, uh, yeah, I should emphasize here that but they are talking about different stuff. Uh, yeah, two and yeah. one, yeah. two and three are in terms of posteriors, and number four, uh, like this graph, is uh, we're essentially looking at probability over these uh, uh, blue dots. Okay, because essentially we want to evaluate uh, uh, the payoff. We, we want to calculate the expected payoff. Uh, conditional on a set of histories, okay? Uh, so that's the result for hazard rate dominance or reverse hazard rate dominance is completely analogous. I believe you can already guess it. So the following condition are equivalent. Uh, if everything remains the chain, uh, remains uh, unchanged, uh, except that the histories under considerations are different. Uh, so here we consider histories uh, on top of a, uh, on the top, but for reverse hazard rate dominance, we consider histories at the bottom. Okay, so that's the, the difference. And uh, essentially uh, hazard rate dominance and reverse hazard rate dominance, they preserve, uh, uh, they, they are preserved under conditioning for certain set of histories. Uh, so, uh, uh, so let me just give you a very brief uh, sketch of a proof for several uh, steps. Uh, to highlight, uh, you know, uh, uh, several equivalence condition here. Uh, first, we show that F reverse hazard rate dominates G implies that the posterior is conditional on the set H T minus uh, still preserve first order. Uh, sorry, uh, reverse hazard rate dominance. So, if notice that the posterior belief measured at a, a particular point P hat here. Uh, can can be written as follows according to the base rule. Okay, notice that this B function is simply the probability of observing a set of history H T minus when the true state is P, and one can show that it is strictly decreasing in P, namely that when P is higher, it is less likely to observe uh, those histories at the bottom. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, so B is a non-active and, and dec strictly decreasing function. 
Okay, and then it follows from the equivalence condition that uh, this is this is we, we care. Okay, so the posterior belief and we, we calculate the expected value of uh, u times v over the uh, over expected value of uh, u using this posterior. And we want to show this is greater than this part. And then according to uh, the equivalence condition we derived earlier for reverse hazard rate dominance, we can guarantee that this holds, right? But, but notice that using uh, this expression here, uh, one can write, uh, sorry, one can write this expression as follows. And this V function is non-active and uh, uh, decreasing, and B is non-active and decreasing. So their product is non-active and decreasing. So the, this inequality fo uh, follows due to this uh, assumption, right? And uh, the equivalence condition we have here, right? So uh, this is this is just to highlight uh, the the power of the equivalence condition I mentioned earlier. So uh, for the other another direction, uh, we can show that f conditional on uh, H t uh, first order. If uh, this holds, then it is sufficient to guarantee f reverse hazard rate dominates g. Uh, for this, uh, we have the following lemma. So uh, Let's, let's consider this set as the set of uh, all length t histories whose empirical frequencies is less than a threshold pH. Then we take any pL less than this threshold. As time goes to infinity, one can show that the posterior belief measured at this point pL converges to this ratio. And similarly under G. Okay, so this uh, nice uh, uh, property allow us, allows us to uh, derive a contradiction easily. Now suppose that F does not reverse hazard rate dominates G, then by the definition in terms of uh, CDFs, we have uh, uh, this, okay? And then we let uh, his, uh, time T goes to infinity and consider this uh, set of history, uh, which, it follows from the fact that the posterior first order stochastically dominates uh, the posterior under G, that uh, this, this ratio under G here is greater than this. Uh, so it leads to a contradiction. Uh, so essentially that's uh, some part of the uh, proof. Uh, so I, uh, for, for the sake of time, I cannot cover all the details. So uh, these, these are the, uh, uh, key results for reverse hazard rate dominance and hazard rate dominance. Uh, so in terms of uh, European options, uh, theorem three and theorem three prime implies the following. So F hazard rate dominates G if and only if for every European call option, uh, the option value conditional on the option is exercised is greater under F than under G. Okay, because for every European option, uh, it is exercised only uh, uh, for uh, histories above a certain threshold, uh, like the uh, figure on the right. Uh, the, above some th certain threshold, then you exercise. Below it, then you do not exercise and you get zero payoff. So conditional on the option is exercised, namely we restrict our attention to the, to the four uh, blue knots then we can calculate the conditional uh, uh, expected payoff. Then uh, here is the, the result. It uh, follows immediately uh, from the previous theorem. Okay, So uh, these are the, uh, a slightly stronger notion of stochastic dominance. But of course, we know that uh, there are even stronger notion of sto stochastic dominance, like uh, the likelihood ratio dominance. Uh, which is used quite a lot in economics. And the definition is, uh, is uh, very well known. It says that F uh, likelihood ratio dominates G if and only if the, the ratio of their densities is increasing in, in P. Uh, but of course, uh, this F and G are rattle nicotine derivatives with respect to some dominating measure. Uh, so it also captures situations in which there are atoms. Okay, so analogous to the previous uh, uh, stochastic dominance relations, we can have a, a 
definition in terms of CDF directly. So here is the definition. And you don't have to look at it uh, because uh, I'll show you a graph. It says uh, it, it says the uh, much better than this. Okay. So here again, we look at the transformations uh, from uh, uh, G to F. Okay, and then we have some uh, uh, the red curve here. Uh, we, we call it phi. And uh, what this uh, uh, alternative definition says is that the slope. Uh, take any uh, point x1, x uh, greater than x2, greater than x3. Uh, what the, the, this definition says is that the slope of uh, C and B is greater than the slope of A and B. Okay. In other words, uh, if you draw such a transformation phi, uh, then it means that phi is convex. Okay. Or in other words, if you put a light bulb at any point on the transformation, then uh, the light can reach any other point on this red curve. So this is uh, already much stronger than uh, reverse hazard rate dominance and hazard rate dominance, uh, in, in which you can only observe the two extreme points. Okay, here you can observe any other point. So uh, for likelihood ratio dominance, uh, it's interesting that we have a, a, a completely analogous equivalence condition expressed in terms of expectations. Notice that here, uh, this V function is only assumed to be non-active. Okay, recall that for reverse hazard rate dominance, this U function that appear here is, is assumed to be non-active and decreasing. For hazard rate dominance, this U is increasing. Here, uh, for likelihood ratio dominance, we do not impose any restriction other than non-activity and measurability, of course. And this, uh, sorry, we're talking about V functions. So I, I just, uh, and this U is uh, increasing, okay? And again, one can think in terms of uh, uh, change of measure as, uh, as before. So using uh, this uh, equivalence condition, uh, one can derive uh, an, uh, some analogous result here. Uh, for the tree model, suppose F and G are non-degenerate at zero or one, then the following are equivalent. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, likelihood ratio dominance of prior belief. And second one, you take any history of uh, length T. Okay, uh, it does not necessarily have to be on the top or on the bottom. It has just to take any such uh, set of length T histories. The only requirement is that the histories in the set must be of the same length. And then conditional on this set of histories, uh, the posterior uh, under F likelihood ratio dominates that under G. In other words, likelihood ratio dominates, uh, dominance relation is preserved under conditioning for any such set of histories. Uh, this is a very nice property because it, you know, the, you can consider basically consider any set of history that interests you, okay, uh, and uh, then the posterior still preserve a likelihood ratio dominance, and we can consider also the weaker condition. Uh, namely the first order stochastic dominance of uh, the posterior. And under this weaker notion, uh, this weaker condition, one can guarantee the first condition, okay? And uh, the four is uh, also analogous for any such set HT, the probability distribution over the set of histories induced by F first order stochastically dominates that induced by G. So the, uh, for instance, the following graph uh, illustrates the set of histories under consideration. It might be uh, all the histories that leads to the three dots uh, in the middle, or you can take uh, uh, one dot from each box on the right and uh, form, a sub, uh, form a set of histories. All of these are allowed, okay? So, uh, uh, you can see that it, it covers a much wider range of uh, histories. So uh, for, um, for option uh, valuation, 
we find that likelihood ratio dominance is related to American options. Uh, unlike uh, European options, where you can only hold it uh, for, uh, uh, where you can only hold it to the termination date and do nothing before it, for American options, uh, you enjoy the flexibility of uh, early exercise. Basically, you can exercise at any time before or at the expiration date. Okay. Uh, notice that here the asset price uh, evolves according to this function, uh, SKT. A T is a, a particular period, and the T is the number of uh, use that you observe. Uh, and the payoff for American call option is uh, simply the following. Uh, and, and this T here it should be uh, uh, the stopping time. Okay, whenever you stop uh, uh, the, the and you 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 look at the the asset price when you stop and and minus the strike price. Uh, essentially, for American options, the decision maker uh, faces an optimal stopping problem. So S uh, K T minus S bar is the payoff when stopping immediately, and the remaining part is the continuation payoff. So suppose that uh, in, in period T, we're at position KT, and next period, uh, with some probability, you receive uh, a new outcome, and therefore you, you have a value function uh, at the not KT plus, uh, K plus one, T plus one. And with the remaining probability, uh, you, you, uh, you are at the not KT plus one, okay? So that's the continuation payoff. So what we have for American option, uh, the first result is that suppose F uh, and G are not degenerate as zero or one and F likelihood ratio dominates G, then the value at every node or conditional on each history, uh, the, the, the option value is greater under F than under G. Okay, this is uh, not, uh, not surprising because uh, our result implies that at any period, uh, conditional on, on any history, the probability you observe an up outcome next period is higher under a likelihood ratio dominating prior. Okay, so, um, because uh, this is the this part. Okay, so likelihood ratio dominance is preserved under conditioning. In particular, it preserved under conditional on a, a single history. Uh, and second result says that suppose F and G are not degenerate at zero or one and F likelihood ratio dominates G, then for every American option, whenever it is optimal to exercise under F, it is also optimal to exercise under G. Okay, so in other words, uh, uh, for every American option, a decision maker with a likelihood ratio dominating prior tends to wait longer. Okay, so it, it, so this is the uh, the meaning of uh, proposition two. And this uh, so is we know that, yeah. This sorry. is this is presumably true for any discount factor delta. Yeah, zero yeah, and for any discount factor. If, but uh, of course, fix uh, a discount uh, fix a uh, discount factor and uh, fix uh, American option. Uh, whenever it is optimal to exercise under F, it is optimal to exercise under G. Uh, is that, Egal, is that uh, what you're asking? Yes. Okay, great. So here, uh, the delta is, is treated as fixed. Okay, so but we know that typically uh, talking about patients, Okay, we know that uh, people with a uh, higher discount factor tend to be more patient because they, they discount the future less, right? And here, uh, the interesting observation is that the likelihood ratio dominance relation among, of, among prior beliefs can also, uh, is also related to patience in a sense, because here, according to proposition two, uh, if your prior belief is a likelihood ratio dominating, then you tend to, uh, whenever it is optimal to exercise under F, you know, uh, whenever it, it is, uh, op sorry, whenever it is optimal to wait under F, 
uh, under G, it is op optimal to wait under F. Okay. Uh, so that's the message that proposition two tries to convey. Uh, about the valuation of options, actually, we can generalize proposition one further. So for proposition one, it's uh, the value conditional on each single history. We can look at the value conditional on uh, a set of histories. That's what we have for uh, theorem six. So uh, if we consider uh, F likelihood ratio dominates G, then this is equivalent to for every American option and every set of history HT such that the option is not exercised, conditional on uh, uh, the option is not exercised, okay? Then the expected option value uh, conditional on this set HT uh, is greater under F than under G. It's a slightly, it is a, a slight generalization of proposition one, okay? So, uh, of course, you can already see that here the results are richer uh, because essentially the uh, likelihood ratio dominance uh, allows us to, is preserved on the condition for a fairly uh, large class of uh, histories, okay? So uh, finally, uh, okay, uh, we are looking, uh, we look at the case in which the prior is fixed, but the histories are different. So we will see what happens. So proposition three says the following, consider two different histories, let's say HT and HT prime. Uh, they have, to, of course, they have to be of the same length. Uh, if HT has more observations of outcome U, then for any prior FP, it could have atoms or any number of atoms as you like. So it's kind of very general, okay? Uh, then the posterior is conditional on this uh, history with higher empirical frequency. First order stochastic dominates the posterior conditional on uh, the history with lower empirical frequency. Uh, that's this this result. So you start from the same prior, and but different beliefs. Uh, sorry, different history will lead to different beliefs, and it turns out that uh, there is a nice uh, first order stochastic dominance among posteriors uh, here. Uh, okay. Sometimes you can also look at uh, po a posterior that's conditional on a set of histories. So here is the corollary of uh, proposition three. So if you look at two sets of histories, HT and HT prime, suppose the frequency of any history in HT is no less than the frequency of any history in HT prime, uh, then still you have uh, uh, this first order stochastic dominance relation of a posterior. Uh, but notice that, uh, uh, here in proposition three, the two histories must have the same length. Uh, if we consider histories with a uh, different length, then this result may not hold. Okay, so in ex you can think about an extreme case in which HT, uh, one history uh, just has one observation, uh, which is an up. Okay, so then uh, for this history, uh, the empirical frequency is one. Uh, you can think uh, you can think about another history that has a very uh, that is very long, okay? Because by the law of large number uh, conditional on this uh, 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 long history, the posterior is concentrated at a certain a point, okay? Uh, so you can in such a situation uh, the posterior uh, that does not satisfy this first order uh, stochastic dominance despite one has higher empirical frequency. Uh, so that's something uh, uh, we have to mention about proposition three. So essentially uh, that's uh, all we have in this paper. So, so uh, yeah, essentially that's just uh, this remark. I, I, I think I covered it. So uh, I think it's, it's I, I have one hour, right? So uh, let me conclude. Uh, Basically, in this paper, we analyze the implications of uh, several different stochastic dominance relations among priors in the uh, binomial tree model. 
which is used a lot in uh, economics. Uh, the, we covered the following stochastic dominance relation. Uh, first order stochastic dominance, reverse hazard rate dominance, and hazard rate dominance. And these two are not, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we do not see a lot of applications of these two stochastic dominance. But uh, here we see that uh, there are uh, some nice results about them and the likelihood ratio dominance. And it's interesting to observe that uh, th these uh, several stochastic dominance relations are closely related to, uh, to each other. Okay, so for many equivalence condition we derive, uh, they are kind of parallel, uh, but each imposes extra conditions or extra requirements. Uh, so for each stochastic dominance relation among priors, we investigated uh, stochastic, stochastic dominance relation of posteriors, and we also examined the probability distribution over certain set of histories, and we demonstrated that this is, uh, could be useful to evaluate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the options, right? Uh, and as an application, we studied the implication of these stochastic dominance relations uh, in subjective option valuation. Uh, basically, uh, that's uh, all the results I would like to present uh, here. So if you have any question or remark, uh, I, I would be very thankful. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> And uh, now, of course, if there are any questions, please people feel free. You can just unmute yourself and ask. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So thanks everyone for uh, for 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 coming to this talk. Oh, have, uh, we can. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait. Um, yeah. I already asked many. I was quiet because I already asked many questions. So yeah, um, yeah. It would be okay if I ask yet yeah, another. No problem. Um, uh, okay. So, um, if is it correct that LR implies uh, both HR and RHR? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And it's the, the strongest of all of them. If if F mm, both hazard rate and reverse hazard hazard rate dominates J, would it uh, would it also dominate it uh, according to the likelihood? No, this no. is uh, uh, yeah. The answer is no. It's quite clear because uh, recall that uh, the, the where is the graph? Okay, let me yeah. Where is it? Uh, so, uh, because uh, if you recall, yeah, here, look at this graph. For reverse hazard rate dominance, uh, it, at any point on this transformation, you can only see the origin. Uh, for hazard rate dominance, you can only see the, uh, the other extreme point, one, one, but not necessarily any other point in between, right? But for likelihood ratio dominance, each point can see any other point. So that's much stronger. But for uh, reverse hazard rate dominance and uh, hazard rate dominance, you can only see one extreme point. So, and, and actually there, there are, uh, you can draw uh, figures, but I don't have it here, but uh, you can draw it, uh, figures like this and show that uh, there are cases in which you can I both see uh, the origin and uh, the extreme point one, one, but uh, not necessarily uh, any other point in, in middle. So uh, there are uh, counter examples uh, like this. So it's, uh, the answer is quite clear. Uh, the re reverse hazard rate dominance and hazard rate dominance, they are together, they, they do not imply likelihood ratio dominance. And you can also look at uh, the history under consideration. For hazard rate dominance, notice that uh, we consider all those histories at the uh, top. For reverse hazard rate dominance, it's only those history at the bottom. Okay, so for uh, for likelihood ratio dominance, it's much richer. It can be uh, anything with the same uh, same length. So it's it's much richer. Uh, 
yeah so this is does that answer the question yes absolutely thanks it just reveals my um lack of knowledge of, of these two um yeah yeah, it's, uh, this I should also mention that yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that this is a very nice question. It's interesting that you did not talk about second order stochastic dominance because that that um, you know that, that's also very often used in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there are actually a lot of work uh, on the second order stochastic dominance. Uh, there are a lot of work uh, have, have been done in that area. Uh, as I mentioned, that the second order domin stochastic dominance and third order uh, stochastic dominance, th these are related to uh, the dispersion or variation of uh, random variables. Here, uh, in the likelihood ratio dominance and the, the rest we're talking about, uh, they are related to the location. Okay, so, uh, so th they, they are different aspects of stochastic dominance. Yeah, but that, you're definitely right. There are a lot of work have been done on about the risk attitude, the second degree, third degree. Yeah, for that we have uh, you know you know nothing to, more to say. Is there a characterization of LR that does not involve the densities, like there is one for the other two? Uh, not including densities, right? Uh, yes, not not the, not the derivatives, but the distribution functions themselves. Uh, yeah. Uh, as I talked, uh, yeah, just I have a uh, here. Just a second. Where is it? Ah, uh, here. Uh, this alternative definition. This is in terms of oh, uh, okay. uh, CDFs. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is uh, the nice thing about uh, this definition is that it only involves the CDFs. It's more direct, and it, and it has this nice graphical property. So mm -hmm. the transformation is uh, convex. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's the uh, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, we thank uh, Tao again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you, thank you for uh, for the questions and uh, for for coming to the talk. Yeah, if you have.